Wes, thanks so much for the opportunity. You know, even though these little talks that I'm having with all these people are kind of after, you know, the horrible circumstances surrounding Jeremy's passing, it's actually in a way got more to do even with the people who contributed to his life and the people who were contributed by him. So, you know, I guess one question that I wanted to start with, if that's okay with you, is do you remember actually meeting Jeremy and your first impressions of him? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. He was, he was a student at UBC, and I was running a Gestalt group. Mm. And um, I don't quite know how he got to me, but he he came across, I was in the counseling department, which was humanistic, and he was in a cognitive behavioral program. Right. And so my first encounter with him was he was in a gestalt group that I ran, and he was a participant in the group. Um, and he was young, alienated, long hair, um, very intense <laughs> and um, right from the start he was Sullivanian when he was in uh, even in undergraduate <laughs> and he was very interested in interpersonal uh, relationship and then he did his dissertation with uh, Wiggins Mm -hmm. who was a personality theorist with a sort of circumplex grid. So I sort of um, uh, contaminated him. <laughs> <laughs> I drew him away from that into working with me on emotion. Uh -huh. And um, there was, and then we be, slowly we became friends. Because, you know, he was a, a student uh, who was new at, uh, in Vancouver, and I was a young faculty member, new, and he wasn't directly my student. Um, but he was clearly very interested in therapy and theory. And so we started a conversation, and then eventually... Um, I sort of enlisted him to do a review of the cognitive, not cognitive therapy, you know, of the cognitive science mm -hmm. literature, because in, in his department uh, was, um, now, I'm, I'm, you know, at my age, I'm starting to forget names. <laughs> uh, you know, this eventually he got the Nobel Prize, Think Fast, Think Slow. Kahneman? Kahneman, Kahneman. Yeah. Right, so Kahneman was in his department and also there was another attention researcher, Anne. Hmm. Hmm. She, was really, she was really good, I liked her. Anne somebody, but they were about focal attention. Yes. Um, so, and I had uh, been influenced by Juan Pasqualeone and uh, now I'm forgetting this other book, but it was a, it was a pivotal book on, on cognition, um, mm -hmm. on attention and effort by, um, n with an N, not in his, uh, anyhow. I, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, it was a very important book, that book. So anyhow, I was interested in, you know more than you can say, and Jeremy was very interested in this. And so eventually he and I actually sat in on a class with Kahneman. This is nicer, sorry to interrupt you. Nicer, nicer. right, exactly, nicer. Yeah, yeah. You know, when I was a doctoral student and then as a young professor, like nicer was an important book. Um, mm -hmm. Cognition and reality. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's interesting to think about. So anyhow, Jeremy was in this department, and so then I invited him to write the book with me on emotion. Mm -hmm. 
and he was going to be, you know, kind of providing the literature on uh, implicit cognition, basically. Right. And, uh, but then we became friend, friends because we were both very um, outsiders. <laughs> <laughs> you said intense. I'm curious what you meant by that. Um, well, he was he was very serious. You know, he wasn't like happy, having fun kind of person. Uh -huh. I was I was married and had children, but um, he was intense in his relationships and his feelings mm -hmm. and his his. In, intellectual intensity right uh, so we hit it off on all those dimensions <laughs> uh -huh. uh, and then he sort of i mean from my perspective he would come i mean i had a stable family and he would come and be like a a younger person and we would provide a kind of a a safe haven Mm -hmm. for him mm -hmm. and um, I mean that was how initially it started right. and then, um, I went to Berkeley for a sabbatical in 1981 I think mm -hmm. and came down to Berkeley and we worked a lot on on the book Emotion and Psychotherapy right we started working on it right And then, you know, it just grew into, um, I mean, there's more, you know, I can carry on, but, but that was the beginning. Right? You had a lot of papers on the intersection between cognition and emotion. Uh, was this partly trying to meet the two worlds you were coming from? Did you have a particular interest? Well, it was really trying to infiltrate. <laughs> a Trojan right. horse of emotion? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was very consciously that. Uh huh. And uh, the idea of hot cognition. Exactly. Uh, and so the idea was that given cognitive therapy was dominant, that it would be useful to uh, write papers to try to get them to pay attention to emotion. Interesting. It's interesting because from the outside perspective of me just reading the papers, it seems that at a certain point you felt like it wouldn't be a smart move to just keep on hammering on that. But Jeremy in the 90s did continue to follow that path. Yes, well then, I mean, Jeremy went to Toronto and we were very friendly at this time. Mm -hmm. So he, he went to Toronto and we spoke a lot about it And he, got, he presented himself as a cognitive therapist, which he really wasn't. Right. And he got this job to run the cognitive therapy unit <laughs> in, in Toronto, right? Uh -huh. And, I mean, what Jeremy was good at, when you look at it in uh, retrospect, I mean, he was a person who had integrated, I mean, he, he, he had integrated, he was well-trained in cognitive, in, he was, least, he was least trained in humanistic, but in emotion, and then in Buddhism, and then in psychoanalysis. So, I mean, he had the most in-depth view of these different traditions than anyone who I know, you know, uh -huh. when I thought about it uh, after his, his death. Uh -huh. It's like, I don't think anybody else had assimilated as many of the different traditions in an in-depth way. Right. Um, you know, he had worked with me on emotion, then he ran a cognitive therapy unit, then he was really into Buddhism, and then into psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and trained in all of them. Right. A lot of people find your 1987, I think, book to be kind of a landmark. Was Did it yeah. feel like that for you? Yes. Yes, it did. Um, 
and it was an attempt to change the field in a sense, you know. <laughs> it's, it's kind of very clear how, in the many ways you influenced Jeremy, I'm kind of curious if you've had a chance to think about how Jeremy influenced you, if he did influence your thinking. Um, I think the most significant influence of him on my thinking was I started off as a humanist and I believed in organismic wisdom and that basically emotion gave you good information. And he, coming from a, having been schooled in uh, a more psychopathological orientation, mm -hmm. he sort of influenced me to introduce the concept of maladaptive emotion. Really? Yeah. I mean, it came out of a lot of discussion, but, you know, I, I think that was, uh, I mean, I, the dialogue between us led to uh, talking about the maladaptive aspects of emotion, where as I started off much more with the adaptive aspects of emotion. Right. And when you look at, you know, emotion theory, with Ekman and Magda Arnold, and they're all talking about the healthy aspects of emotion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, that was one of his influences. But you see, I was never impressed with the notion of uh, the relational process. Right. Um, I thought it was the basic psychoanalytic perspective. And when he would talk about that, but then event, I, I wasn't, you know, I didn't, I wasn't interested in incorporating that particularly mm -hmm. because I thought it was already a known phenomena. But then um, I, encouraged him, if he was interested in it, to try and do a task analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, this is more my influence on him, right? right. Uh, but then, after he had really, and I, I remember he was in Toronto and we walked around and I sort of helped him set up the idea of how to do a task analysis on a relational rupture. Mm -hmm. um, but then that influenced me. I, I mean, I started seeing it when he, when it was more specified as a useful thing and not just as a transference kind of phenomenon. Okay. okay. Um, and so then we incorporated that back into EFT, you know, as a marker, a right. marker guided a marker of an alliance rupture, and I found that useful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think he influenced me more as a friend. Mm -hmm. In what way? Um, well, he became one of the people that I knew the best and the longest. Um, he was quite... Um, alone and I was quite alone having immigrated from South Africa mm -hmm. and we stayed in contact and we would have very good uh, soul conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot had to do with the absurdity of academia. <laughs> uh -huh. And our criticisms of positivistic research. So we, we, we both engaged in the field, but we're very critical of yeah. the field. Sounds like you made each other a bit less alone. Yes, exactly, exactly. I think that was the most important thing. So we were really like a, a support group for each other. 
And then he was in Toronto. You know, we went through each other's life uh, crises together and successes, I guess, you know. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But you, you, at a certain point, you, I think, you didn't really work together, at least officially, at a certain point. Right, right. I mean, definitely. I mean, after the emotion uh, epic period, You know, he started working on the Alliance, and then we no longer worked together. He sort of went back to his own roots. Right. I mean, the, the emotion thing had been, uh, you know, that's not where his heart was. His heart was in the relational process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we worked out a very good, you know, mutual respect for each other. Mm. Yeah. But most of all, he was a very good friend. And when I lost my wife, he came up to the memorial and I said to him, if I couldn't read my speech, if I was too uh, distraught, he, he would read it for me. So he wow. was sort of like my uh, backup. Wow, that's really powerful. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, we, we had this good, I mean, we, he, he moved to New York and we didn't see each other that much, but whenever we did, there was a strong connection. Mm -hmm. And um, then we would always talk, you know, and uh, we would talk about the complexity and the politics of research, mm -hmm. you know, and he was trying to influence the psychoanalytic people <laughs> to, be me re to be more research oriented. Right. And um, I was trying to influence humanism, but I was trying to influence the field to be more process oriented, not outcome oriented. And neither of us believed in the traditional models. Mm -hmm. of research, of outcome and RCTs and things like that. Right. So we were a good support for each other in being not mainstream or not conventionally mainstream. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. What do you think you'll miss most, old Jeremy? I'll miss the times we would get together at the conferences and just uh, talk about our lives. I mean, we, you know, we would share what was going on in our lives. But also the... Um, well, we, we stopped talking intellectually, but mm -hmm. I'll, I'll miss the sense of camaraderie that we both really knew and could talk to each other at this level where we understood each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a great place. And if you want to leave us with any like memory you have or you know reflection of Jeremy. Um, I can remember persuading Jeremy to buy a house. <laughs> <laughs> really? Uh, Yeah, you know, he was single and uh, he was in Toronto and I had, I had bought a house and I convinced him that it was really economically good to buy a house. Uh -huh. And then uh, I visited him in that house and I just have memories of, uh, you know, I have memories of us getting a little drunk together and uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, there's a sadness, not only about his loss, but I think he, he and I shared sadnesses, so somehow I'll miss sharing sadness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. And you know Fido, right? Mm -hmm. Um, it appeals to that uh, sense of the tragic or to the sense of 
And I think he and I would both reverberate to that kind of yeah. uh, feeling. Which ironically made you feel more in touch with each other, like you're not alone in this. Yes, yes, yes. And, um, you know, he'd had many losses in his life, in his family. Mm -hmm. And I had known his mother and he had an uncle who was uh, influential, who was actually a psychologist. Mm. Um, and I had met them along the way. So, you know, I got to know his family right. as well. Uh, I had met his sister as well. Um, so he, he was a bit more like family. You know, when I say we became friends and he used to come, he was sort of like family. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, in terms of other memories, you know, when he got married and had children, he was very happy. <laughs> and that was the time he was the happiest. Mm -hmm. I remember that. Um, yeah, but no, I don't have, I, I'm pretty bad with having memories anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> All the ones you're sharing are wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Good. Good. Thank you so much for this, Les. All right, right. And thank you for doing this. Yeah.